This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com. Of course, follow us on Instagram at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm, I'm joined by director Christopher Wells, who recently directed the film Stories for My Children's Children, Lessons from the Holocaust. Welcome to the show, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. For, thanks for having me. I guess my first question for you is, um, how did this project come about? Like, where, what was the impetus for this? Well, um, Daniel Ronick, Rolnick, the son of Sarah Rolnick, who's the narrator of, of the documentary, uh, he approached me, um, gave me some idea that he, what he wanted to do, which was to just sort of document the history of his family so he can pass it on to his children, her grandchildren. And they didn't really see anything past just the history of the family and just to kind of keep it contained with, within the family. I saw a bigger story there. I thought, Others could benefit from learning about it, and uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, you know, get the gig and produce and direct it. And very thankful for it. I think what attracted me to color correction was the fact that we were like the next stage of cinematography, and the creative side was huge. Trying to understand what was wrong with an image, how to balance it, trying to understand how to let the tools do what you want them to do. Where else can the technology go? What else can we do? I'm very interested in trying to mold the image and create the best look possible. And whatever tools are out there, you want to try and latch onto them. I'm Eric Whip, and this is my course on color correction. So one of the things, like once you came on and started producing uh, and directing it, you know, like I think about all the classic or like the well-known and established uh, documentaries like Shoah or uh, Night and Fog. And those are sort of on the, the opposite ends of the spectrum. One's fully just talking and the other's fully visuals only. So how did you approach this to create a visual style or, or look for the film? Well, we were very limited. The budget was very small. Um, and it wasn't like we had all this footage to use. We had a few photographs. Um, so I basically just had to create something from very little. Um, my whole thing was the story is so compelling. I just have to figure out a way as a director how to tell it because even though it's, it's a traumatic uh, story and, and there is some uplifting parts of it, um, it's very true. And, and this is history. And I, I, I have to be very careful in how I tell this story, but it is also entertainment. People have to, cause you know, I, I'm making it for an audience. So um, I basically just looked at all the materials for the B-roll of what I had, which were photos. And um, I just came up with an idea of, okay, we're going to interview her here in the living room. And we dress that set. And then I, kind of had more of like an over the shoulder, um, kind of more casual approach to um, kind of counter, counterbalance uh, the, you know, the, the more formal uh, interview in, in the living room. And then of course, um, injecting some of the, uh, the, the photos that, that, that we had, but I mean, but, but I think with limitations, you can become more creative, but it was always the story that I really focused on. And how do I tell this story without, really using too much bells and whistles because it's just not that kind of film. Mm -hmm. Well, and so to go back to uh, originally you had said uh, that you worked with her son or her, it was her son who sort of got this rolling. So how did you work with him to figure out questions and uh, you know, like, was he part of the interview process? Like, was he there or did you sit with him beforehand? Well, well, she was very nervous. And usually what, if someone's very nervous, I'll have a family member that actually asks the questions. I don't need to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, so she felt a little bit more comfortable with him asking. But before we even went into production, we basically, I just needed an outline of, okay, what are the beats that we have to hit? What are the story beats that we have to hit? Um, and so when you're dealing with someone who's never been in front of the camera before, you never want to give them a script. You just want to give them 
certain out, you know, a, an outline with certain points that they want to hit, and then they can fill in the blanks. And then in editing, we can kind of get rid of all the stuff that, you know, we don't need. So he was, um, created that list with Sarah, the narrator. Um, we went over it and then we shot this in four days, <laughs> which is pretty incredible. Um, and they were separated because we couldn't shoot it consecutively because my DP had um, a scheduling uh, issue. So we shot it, I think, Monday, Wednesday, then Monday, Wednesday, um, which created its own set of problems because we had to light it exactly the way it looked previously because mm -hmm. we had to strike the set every time. But he, but Daniel was was very much involved in terms of the outline, the script, getting make, making sure that when she would talk, we we made he made sure okay you didn't hit this point or let's make sure that we mention that and and uh so without him obviously the the, the film that would never uh happen well you you mentioned you sort of touched on it like she was a little nervous to do these very interviews, understandably yeah and so i'm wondering um you know when you have such a difficult subject matter and you have a uh, um, an interviewee who's a little nervous like how do you work with them to pull them out you've touched on it a bit with him interviewing but like sometimes they're going to be very <laughs> protective so I'm wondering what your techniques are um well each person is different um you don't even though you have lights microphones a crew you know you try to make them comfortable on set so you always want to kind of bring them on set in between getting makeup done to so they're used to it so it's not like they're they're coming on set for the first time and okay action like you don't want to do that mm -hmm. you, so you want to just get them used to the idea and in about like an hour or so they kind of understand okay that this is now the reality of, of what's going to happen um you also don't want to give them a script like i said before having an outline helps them so mm -hmm. and we just let things roll. I mean, when, when she's talking, we can interrupt and say, Oh, you know, just, just go back to here. It's more of a conversation. The minute that you remind them, okay, I'm a director. You're the person who's going to be now. Then they get nervous. Then they start to overthink it. And I always tell them, I said, look, even if you ramble on, we can edit that out. And by shooting it with two cameras, we can now edit between camera A and camera B. So if she says the first part perfectly, but then let's just say she, talks at great lengths of something that we may not need well i can cut all that out and just cut to camera b and i let them know that i say you have the freedom to do and say whatever you want we'll take care of it so you just want to guide your the person in front of the camera in a way that they can make as many mistakes as they want and it's okay because the minute that they think that they can't make a mistake they start to think about mm -hmm. what they have to say and you want everything to be natural and organic and 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 every every no one's stressing out everyone's having a good time and it's just a conversation no because one of the things i noticed in this was she she kind of educates us or sort of gives us a lot of understanding of the jewish traditions and the various things throughout so was that something that naturally happened uh, in the interview process or is that something you guys uh, sort of realized as you were going you could talk to her about well we always refer to the bullet points in the in the uh, outline, but if there was something that she touched upon that we really liked, but maybe she didn't feel comfortable going more into it, and let's say if, if it was off the, the the outline, we would say, "Hey, yeah, keep keep talking about that." And so some of it was very much so of from the outline, and some of it was just her just being herself, and just we were just guiding her and you know give us as much as you possibly can because we'll we'll take care of it in, in post-production mm -hmm. now i will speak in a post so i'm wondering when you started cutting this did you how much did you follow the path in which she talked because i know she follows like she goes linearly but then we have the two stories of her father and her mother they're completely separate so i'm wondering um like how did you find that balance of going between the two well, it, I, I only laughed because there was so much that we had to cut <laughs> and the, the editing, uh, she was very nervous, rightfully so. Uh, she's never done this. Um, so there was, at first when I got all this footage, I'm like, oh my God, I don't, I don't know how we're going to um, really approach this. 
Um, even though we had the outline, there was so much weeds that we had to kind of go through. So basically we just had to immediately just get rid of all the stuff that we knew we weren't going to use. Okay, now I understand what we have, what we have to have. I'm looking at the outline and I'm and I don't want to reveal too much in the beginning um, because obviously towards the end of the film, she she talks about how she discovered something very significant about her father. And at first I thought, well, maybe I can lead with that because that would be a great hook. But I thought, I, I don't need to have that hook. There's already enough interest in what she's saying. I can put that towards the end. And so I had the outline of, of, of the bullet points that I needed to have in the documentary, but there wasn't, I really just wanted to kind of feel it out. Um, so I allowed myself to, and, and the, obviously the editor, I mean, I'm working hand in hand with, with Mark, the editor, um, basically, okay, how, what's the best way to unravel the story and what feels good? A lot of times when you're editing, you're, you're just sort of feeling, okay, what, what feels right? You, you're referring to an outline, but, it, but that's just what you need in the, in the documentary. Once when someone is talking and, and you're kind of putting everything together, things kind of change and you, you shouldn't be afraid of that as a, as a producer director, you have to allow things to emerge and, and, and fall into place organically, I think. Well, and you talk about the sort of realization of um, her father. Um, I don't want to give it away for those who haven't seen the film, <laughs> but was it also a realization that her mom was helping the family back in Poland? Or is that something you guys knew going in? Well, I didn't know a lot of yeah. stuff. And, and so when I got this, when, in the very beginning, when I got the, uh, the out, uh, it's just the, the premise of the story, um, I, I, I was discovering things right before we were shooting and, and, and like, I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is incredible. But yeah, the mother helping the family who hid her during uh, the war, she was hiding in, in uh, Poland in a, in a, a barn for two, two and a half years. Uh, the family, the, the Ashikas, they, they um, risked their lives to, to hide a, a Jewish family on their property. And then after when the war ended, uh, she moved to America and then she was able to give them uh, certain things that they needed because they weren't rich by any means. And uh, that obviously touched me very much because they weren't obviously expecting anything out of it. They were just trying to help a fellow person, uh, which is a, a lesson that I think we all can, can, can learn. Um, and to show that she was so grateful um, to always be there for this family, whatever they needed, she would somehow figure out a way to, to get it to them. If it was a washing machine or a, a warm winter jacket, uh, essentials. I mean, they weren't asking for chocolates or, you know, something that's uh, extravagant. They were asking for, uh, things just to stay alive. And so that, that is a, one of the inspiring things about this documentary. It's not just doom and gloom, even though we don't, um, you know, we definitely talk about those things because they're real and, and they, it's a tragedy, but there is inspiring notes in this documentary that I'm hoping that people will, will catch up on and uh, inspire them to, to do, to be kind to others. Now you had mentioned that you cut a lot out. What was some of the stuff you guys uh, cut and left on the cutting room floor that you wanted to put in, but just couldn't make it for time? Well, there was, in the first cut that we did before we did a test screening, uh, she talked about how she's the daughter of two survivors of the Holocaust and her parents were um, very conscious of the food that they had. And so they would, the mother especially, would buy extra food and almost like hoarding food. And that Sarah, the narrator, the daughter, she started to do that. And at first I thought that, that was very interesting how, you know, your parents have certain things that they do and, it, and, and, it, and the kids start to, you know, they grow, we, we, we hate to, to, to say it, but we, we become our parents as we grow older. And, uh, and she started to realize that she had so much food and, and she realized, oh, that's because of my mom. And so we had like maybe 15 minutes of, of talking about the significance of food and, and in their culture and, and how she's. Uh, not so far from her from her mother, 
um, in terms of, 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 of hoarding food and, and, and just buying food, like for, even for neighbors, just, you know, God forbid if something happens to them and, and it just didn't fit in the flow of the, of, of the overall arc of what we wanted to say. And so we cut that out and it, it was about like 15, 20 minutes that we cut out. And it's so important to have a test screening because we realized that certain people were starting to lose a little interest in those points, even though we thought that they were important. And when we cut it out, even though the film is now, I think it's like 62 minutes, it feels like it's 40. It moves very quickly. But, but if we were to, to have left that section in, it would have felt probably twice as long. So um, I'm, I'm glad that we, we cut it out. But, but, I, but I was surprised that I, I went into it thinking that we were going to have it in because I, 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 I found it very interesting. Um, but you, you have to listen to the test audience. Well, it, it's interesting because I also think the other thing I was going to ask you, and it's probably not a very good question because you probably can't answer it, but I think about all the people I've met from World War II, whether they're uh, Holocaust survivors or soldiers, and a lot of them don't want to talk about it. And even if they do tell you stories, they're ten they tend to hold back on certain elements. Mm. So do you think... Do you think we got to hear everything from her or do you think her parents held stuff back from her? Well, the, the father definitely held stuff back and that's revealed in the documentary. Mm -hmm. He couldn't even talk about his previous family because you had two people that had very separate lives. And unfortunately for her father, um, she wasn't born yet, obviously, but her, her father um, had a whole other family, a wife and two kids and tragically, um, they're no longer with us and uh and they died during the war in in a brutal way so um you know she she just she she revealed as much as she could as much as she learned from from her her father so i i don't i don't think that she left anything behind i mean we we for four days we definitely pretty much hit everything um i mean obviously when, when she did it she felt like oh she she, she was worried if she did a good job or not and I, I thought she did great and and then obviously the magic of editing we, you know we, we can kind of um, streamline that conversation uh, to get rid of all like the the little pauses that naturally when people speak um, but no there, there wasn't anything that she left behind but there was definitely a lot that her father didn't talk about and I guess we'll never know if those stories will ever emerge but I mean she found things in a vault and she found a lot of stuff. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think there was really anything that we, that we'll discover later on that we didn't yeah. put in the documentary. Now I have one last question to sort of lighten the mood and wrap things up. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? <laughs> I mean, I, I watch a lot of films and, and TV. I, I guess one of my favorite films, which is totally, um, not even on the subject that we were talking about previously, but uh, one of my favorite films is by Richard Linklater, Days and Confused. Uh, it's just such a relaxing film. It's just kind of funny and goofy. Uh, nothing, nothing tragic happened. There's no um, real uh, dire situation in it. It's just sort of like, you know, kids in, yeah. in high school. And uh, um, when that film came out, um, you know, obviously I was a, a lot younger and um, it was, I just, it just kind of makes me feel, it just makes me laugh in a sense. So that it's, I guess, one of my guilty pleasures. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. That's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com. Of course, follow us on Instagram at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Raquel. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.